working properly here and we can move on with any new things that we're going to cover for today's session. Okay, so again, the last discrepancy list is here. So we're comparing this one to the list that we have, sorry, let me get this out of the way as well, so to the list of the equipment that we have. So we have two lists of equipment, one with discrepancies, one with not. And why do we have these two? Because eventually we're going to add the data from these two to the actual physical verification template that I believe you should see on screen now, yes? That looks like this. In this case, we already have the equipment populated. I already copied and pasted the data, but nevertheless, I wanna go through the process just because sometimes you need to make sure that what you have copied and pasted has fallen into the proper columns. And sometimes it may be misplaced depending on how you copied and pasted things or the layout itself, and we'll see it in a, in a bit, and may have an extra column that the physical verification template does not have. So again, first things first is to make sure that we're in the correct tab. This one is the PV template tab. And here's where we're going to paste the information that we have extracted using T code I808 for the list of equipment for the maintenance plant CD10. So the list that I have here, or whatever, I, the information that I have pasted here and that we see on screen now, will belong to not this Excel where it has the discrepancies, but the Excel, let me get to that one here, the Excel that does not have the discrepancy list. So all we have to do was select, copy, and then paste into the physical verification template. That was the first thing we did. And then we went to the previous discrepancy results tab. And what we did here was paste the information that we had from the discrepancy one. So in this case, we'd be looking at the other Excel where we have our discrepancies. Okay, now this is the one we have to be a bit careful with because although we have selected the physical verification, the physical verification layout, it does not match exactly. So if you can see here, I have the plant CD10 and then the equipment column. If I go back to the physical verification template and I go to previous discrepancy results, realize that my first column is only equipment and it's not plant. So if I copy and paste directly, the information will not be there accurately, right? Will not be reflected accurately. And what does that mean? That especially for this last section here to the right, when we're pasting the verification date uh, verified by discrepancy and so on, this area has to then be reflected in the tab PV template. So if I scroll to the right, you'll see now that in this area here where it says previous physical verification result, we have the verification date and discrepancy type that the, the Excel is taking from the tab previous discrepancy results. So if you do not see that there, when you have pasted your information into the tab discrepancy results, that's because something may not be in the proper column. So make sure that everything is pasted into the proper column and then you should be able to see these fields populated. Okay, and as you move more to the right, you see also other columns that should take the information from other tabs. We didn't really spend time on those because they weren't critical for the uh, physical verification process that we're covering during these WebEx sessions. So we only stuck to these two, previous discrepancy and PV template. Okay, and why was it important? Because I remember yesterday there was a question on, is it important to extract the list of previous discrepancies? And it is because, again, we're, we're doing all of this because we want to document accurately uh, the information collected, right? So it's important for equipment management, and it also serves as input for KPI reporting and audit purposes. So it is important that we do state in, uh, in this template the last discrepancies, and then of course, the new ones, right, if they have changed. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna be playing with the list of equipment and the last discrepancy list, and we're gonna be adding now the new and mandatory fields, right, and the new discrepancies that we may have found as SD08 while doing the physical verification. Okay, so mainly that's just to go through the things that may have been um, 
either misunderstood yesterday during the WebEx, maybe I didn't explain myself well, or uh, due to technical difficulties, we couldn't follow. So hopefully that's clear now. And if there are any questions on that part before I move on, now is the time to ask them. But please, the questions focused on this exactly. We can deal with the other ones later on as we go on through the session. So I'm just going to give a quick 30 seconds to see if there's any questions. And if not, I'll just move on to what we're supposed to cover today. We do have a question from Nanette who is asking if it's possible to send a Moja notification to each staff member on a monthly basis on item assigned to staff member. Um, the monthly notification. Okay. Well, uh, we'll take note of that uh, question just because I, I really wanted to focus on what I just explained now before we get into that. And especially in terms of notifications uh, related to Equipment and equipment reports. Items assigned to staff member. Okay, so um, there's a way. I mean, it has to deal with notifications. It's a completely different process. But you know what? We'll put that one aside, and maybe we can get to that later on. Just because I don't want to switch completely the subject. Let me see if now I'm going to swap this, and hopefully the WebEx does not crash like yesterday, and no, it seems like it's fine so far, right? Say that you can see it on your screen. Yes, perfect. Okay, so we should all have on our screens the WebEx session two and what we're going to be covering today. And again, uh, the question that was just asked, we'll just push that later on, okay, especially because it's related to notifications more than uh, what we're looking at today. So again, let's see what we're uh, looking at and the objectives. Again, the objective for the overall sessions are to validate the accuracy of Equipment Master data. And that's why we're uh, looking into the uh, list of equipments that we're extracting, last discrepancies, populating the physical verification template, and so on. But for today's objective, exactly what we're going to see today mainly is here related to understanding how to capture the physical verification results against each equipment record. So that's one of the main things during today's session. We're going to understand how to capture the physical verification results and also how to document the discrepancies and upload results using the PV template. That's mainly what this session is going to focus on today. And again, we're still sticking to the enterprise role, SD08. Okay, we have not yet uh, reached uh, the SD11. That will be in tomorrow's session. So right now, we're still acting as the equipment verification planner. And please uh, forgive me for still having here physical verification planner, since these uh, PowerPoints were done previously to uh, understanding the change in the name or the correct name. Some of these may have the wrong name. But I, nevertheless, I'm changing that, and I may send you these uh, presentations later on correctly. OK, so again, we have the Equipment Verification Planner, and in the PowerPoint, what we're going to do and what we're going to look at today. We saw that we created, there was an Equipment pl Verification Plan created by the SD08. We print the equipment list. We generate the list of equipment based on the verification plan, and we perform inspection and record findings. Okay, so mainly we talked about this yesterday. Today, prepare upload file for physical verification and review and upload PV results. Again, you will have this slide, and since you have this already in your inbox, we'll just click through this quickly. So that was yesterday's session we saw there. That would be for the high-level process step two, and today would be the high-level process step six, where we're going to upload the template. And you'll receive one of these uh, per session and what we're going to cover and what we're not. So as you can see here, let me just step back quickly. The first session is at the top, and today we're only covering step six and step nine, okay? Not step 19. This we'll see tomorrow. Okay, so let's see what we're looking at today. 
and what will be important in today's session. So again, results of the physical verification are captured and characteristics values are uploaded against each equipment on the verification list using the mass upload tool. So today we're going to learn that exactly. How to select the discrepancies, how that affects the characteristics in the PV template, and then again how to upload this mass upload tool or the PV template tool that we're going to be using to record these discrepancies. Now it's very important that we understand that right now all we're doing is just recording discrepancies we're not really making any changes to the equipment that will come tomorrow. Right now we're just writing in the system or telling the system that there are certain discrepancies and keeping record of it. Okay, so what is important today and what I want you to remember, that correct format and length for each characteristic is very important. We'll see that if we make a mistake in terms of format, the uh, PV template will uh, return an error and will not let us upload or at least even generate the text file that it will generate directly from the Excel. And also we're going to be taking a look at these fields, verification date, verified by, and discrepancy type, the three fields that are mandatory. And then again, the ones that become either blocked or optional depending on the discrepancy type to use, change in user, change in location, change in status, change in serial number, change in barcode, change in authorization group, and then another column called comment. And again, what's important, we have 10 characteristics, which are right here, and the discrepancy type that we select, which is very important because it determines if characteristics are blocked or optional, as I mentioned before. So here's the last uh, shot of the screen. Now, I don't think there are any questions on this. I don't know, say that there's been anything new since the last question. So I can move on to the next slide. And then we're going to, what we're going to do is cross-reference what we're showing on the PowerPoint versus the actual Excel, right? the physical verification template itself. Okay, so. Just to interrupt you, sorry. Yes. Um, further. Like, Ikhan is asking, um, what do you mean by length of each characteristic? Okay, thank you. So, yes, we're going to see that in the next slide, but what I mean is that what the uh, physical verification template that we're going to be populating allows you to write, or the amount of characters that it allows you to write in the actual Excel. So there is, uh, you have to be careful with what you're adding and how you're typing it into the Excel as, for example, the dates. You should write, today is the 3rd of October 2018, right? So it should be 03.10.2018. If not, the Excel will not recognize or could make a mistake when generating the text file. And when you upload that to Moja, then you'll have an error because you're supposed to follow these. Um, there's not that many. I think there's four or five. We're going to see that in a slide, but there, it tells you exactly how you should populate some of the fields so that you don't have this error in Umoja when uploading the files. So we're going to get to that in a second. Okay, first of all, what I want you to look at here is what we have in terms of mandatory fields and how what you add or what you select in a mandatory field affects the other optional characteristics or fields that are optional. So here we, go. here we go. Some characteristics are mandatory and others optional. However, adding data in mandatory fields like discrepancy type will limit the data that can be added to some characteristic fields. Okay, so, and here we go. The mandatory fields, as we see here in the box, the red box, of course, relate to discrepancies. And what this means is that, of course, we have to select something here in these three columns. We have to select the discrepancy type. We have to add the data verified by and the verification date. Okay, so these fields will be mandatory, even though they're all no discrepancy found, right? If we are generating this uh, Excel, if we are adding a list of equipment and the last discrepancy, we're going to have to say something in the records. We're going to have to mention if there's a discrepancy or not. 
So these are the mandatory fields, and that's what that means by mandatory. We have to select something and add something in these fields. If not, when we try to generate the text file, the Excel will give us an error message that we'll see in the next slide. Now, by selecting one or the other, as this uh, screenshot taken from the job aid reflects, that will result in the following. For example, blocked fields, as we see here in yellow. What does that mean? That means that if I select, and the next slide may explain it a bit better, if I select 00, zero or no discrepancy found, or I select 01 not found yet, what that means is that I shouldn't be able to add any data in these fields. If I do add data in these fields, when I try to generate the text file, the Excel will return an error. So these fields should remain empty. Then you'll see how it changes for the ones below, for 02, 03, and 04. So let's go on with my next animation here. Optional. And now well, I'll explain why it means optional. So let's see here. If I select 02, that means now I can actually populate change in user, change in location, change in status. So these are the ones I should populate because these are the ones that are related to this discrepancy. User, location, status. See? user, location, status. But now, I shouldn't have to add any other information to the next three fields. Change in serial number, barcode, authorization group. Why? Because those relate to the discrepancy number three. And that's why below you have these optional and these blocked. Now, the last discrepancy type here, number four, multiple master data, and it also shows here 0, 02 and 0, 03. It's sort of a combination of both of these. So let's say if we have to make a change in user for a piece of equipment, but also change the authorization group, then we would need to select this type of discrepancy because it allows us to add anything into any of these fields. Now it says optional and not mandatory because as an SD08, and here maybe um, Sega, if you um, feel like you need to jump in to tell me if I'm wrong or right, I've tried this before, but it doesn't necessarily require you as an SD08 reporting this to add anything in these fields. As long as you add the date, the verified by, and the discrepancy type, the other fields, right, let's say I select um, maybe um, discrepancy 02, are only optional, not required. So I could still upload the file into Umoja without adding any other information in these fields. And it would still allow me to do that. Now, the problem is that, of course, uh, if I send that report to an SD11, they wouldn't know exactly what the discrepancy is. Now, I don't know if, Sega, you want to add something more to that, but at least as I've seen it in the job aid and I also practiced it in the training environment myself, there's really not a need or the, the Umoja does not force you to add any data to these fields, only the ones that are mandatory. Okay, we cannot hear you. I'm not sure if you're actually trying to speak up or not. Maybe she can you hear me now? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay. Um, just to note that there's a change that came into production very recently to make, um, even though the characteristics are blocked, uh, they will still need to enter not applicable, so NA. Um, and we will be updating the job aid to reflect that. So it's not mandatory, but you st they still have to put not applicable. Okay, actually, if you do not write anything on there and just click on the Generate button, yeah. It, it yeah. does it for you, right? It just it does. writes but and then on the, on the load file, um, huh? it, it's, if you delete the NA and upload it, before you used to accept it. But now, so if they leave it blank and you generate the, the load file, it will automatically yes. put NA. But some users were going into the load file and make, deleting the not applicable and uploading the file. So for that reason, now it's mandatory that it, even if they go into the load file and make changes to delete the not applicable, it will give error. Okay, yes, that, that, that is definitely a difference. Yes, it makes a lot of sense, Sega. Yeah. So let's say that I'm not, uh, I'm not a very good SD08, right? I don't write any information here in the change user and I just upload this telling the SD11, right? Or, or creating a report where I say, listen, there are discrepancies but I haven't told you what's going on. I just uh, uploaded this as not applicable. 
is is there a way that these will become mandatory maybe later on and you will have to add something there? I mean, it's just because then the job of the SD11, let's say if these are two different people, maybe I'm saying something that doesn't make much sense, but it could happen. Let's say if I don't write any information there, I'm not really making the other person's job uh, easier possible. Um, so, uh, Brian, so what I meant is, so the way it was before, so you generate the, the template like you showed uh, earlier, and if for all the items that are blocked, uh, when they generate the file, it will say not applicable on the load file. And there's no reason to play around with the load file. Like, when I say load file, I'm talking about the text file that they used to upload into, the, into Moja. Um, if that is the practice, then everything will work correctly. But in the past, we noticed that they would uh, prepare the template, create it, generate the load file, and then make adjustment in the load file itself directly in the text, in the notepad text that was generated from the template. And, and then users were uploading it with the blank uh, characteristics when, it's, when the ones that are blocked. So for the KP, for physical verification KPIs, we rely on the change on the values that are in the characteristics. So if it's so if it's blocked, it should be not applicable. So the load file will automatically put not applicable. But now we also added one more restriction to prevent the user from going directly to the load file, deleting the not applicable and uploading the file with the blank characteristics. Yes, no, Sega, that's clear, and maybe I didn't uh, explain it correctly. What I was saying is that let's say I select the discrepancy type three, right? Okay. But I, so I'm letting you know there is a discrepancy, but I really don't write anything in these optional fields. Like I don't mm -hmm. say what's the change in authorization group, right? Mm -hmm. When I do generate the document, it'll it'll generate the not available. Yes. Let's say yes. I, I don't uh, update the text file either. I just upload this into Emoja. I'm mm -hmm. letting you know there is a discrepancy, but I'm not telling you what it is yes. or what it yes. should be corrected. Now, right. is this normal practice? Should this be... The, the proper procedure? Should the SD08 have to write something there? No, it's still optional. But I mean, by optional, I mean it will, the system will automatically select not applicable if this field is left blank. Um, so the, the physical verification planner might not know what the new serial number is or what the barcode should be changed to or what authorization group should be updated. So for that reason, we didn't make it mandatory. But if they do know that information, it will make it easier for the technical section to go in and uh, resolve the discrepancy. All right, yes. That, well, that explains it clearly. The fact that SD08 does not need to know, right, what the uh, new authorization group is, or but does know that there's a discrepancy, marks it, uploads it, and at least then the SD11 would be the one responsible to make the changes. Okay, so that's that's uh, quite clear. All right, thank you, Sega. So we can move on to the next part of the uh, PowerPoint here. Yes, Sega. Maybe before going on, uh, I have a question from Nico asking about when can we change the barcode. Um, he says, why is there the option change in barcode? The equipment number identify the item for the entire life of the item in Umoja. So when can we change the barcode? Um, Brian, I can take that. Uh, yes, thank you, Sega. All right. So the barcode um, in this case is the, uh, tech, the technical ID number in the equipment record. So when the equipment is purchased, that initially at the time of goods receipt, the equipment number is created, and it will copy all the details from the shopping cart into the equipment record. And the barcode will be defaulted to the equipment number in Emoja. So one of the process for receiving a serialized item, and as uh, described in the job aid, a separate job aid for that, is that the user has to go in and update a few things in the equipment record that don't get copied from the shopping cart. So one of them is the barcode, one of them is the authorization group, um, and there's in this uh, manufacturer serial number. Um, so for the barcode, initially it's going to copy the equipment number, but if you're using a, a bar that's pre-printed barcode, 
you have to put the barcode in the equipment and then put the number in, in the system because that won't be generated automatically. So uh, during the physical verification, the verification user might notice that there's a barcode um, that's um, on, the, on the equipment record, but it's not reflected in the system correctly. So that would be a discrepancy that the technical section will have to go in and make sure that the barcode in Emoja is the same as what's uh, printed on the, on the equipment. Okay, thank you, Sega. Perfect. Uh, I think that that answers the question, hopefully. If not, Nico can let us know. Oh, yeah, perfect. All right, so we can move on. And again, this uh, next slide mainly just uh, visualizes what I was explaining before, or it explains it in a, in a different way, but I believe it was quite clear what we understood, right? So I'm just going to skip through this one. So remember, again, depending on the discrepancy that we select, then the fields become blocked. And you see there's a screenshot here of the error message you may get if uh, trying to populate something you shouldn't, right? That should be blocked. Input is only permitted if the discrepancy type selected is 03 see, or 04. So the actual Excel will let you know what you're doing wrong depending on the discrepancy type you have selected. And here visually, again, what you can populate depending on what you select. So if you select 02, you should populate these three first fields. Again, the change in status is an actual drop-down list. You can't type that in. You have to select from the drop-down list. And we'll take a look at that right away. And if we select now discrepancy 03, the same thing now for the other three columns, serial number, barcode, authorization group. And then number four, as we saw before, all of the fields would be optional. So I believe this uh, slide kind of summarizes it clearly. And the next one, before we go into the Excel, tells you what each one of the discrepancy types selected stands for. So we have this already in our inbox, so I can go through it quickly, right? So if there's a change in user, right, the discrepancy that it is, and also what it means, the assignment, the business partner could be, or the user it is assigned to. If we select 0204, we could also mean change in location here. It's the incorrect functional location. If you guys review the job aid available in iSeq, that is also explained there. So depending on here, what it wants us to change, or the column that is called change in status, change in location, change in user, what that means, right? What it's asking you to change. So incorrect user status for change in status. And it's the same thing for the other three columns that we have under characteristics. So if we're going to write something in serial number here, it's the incorrect serial number, barcode, incorrect barcode, and authorization group, incorrect authorization group. So I think it's quite clear. And it's uh, quite simple here. Just make sure that you're selecting the right discrepancy type before you populate one of those fields. Okay, and now I believe that, here we go. This is the slide that reflects the information, I believe. Uh, hold on, maybe we can go and I think there's some guys working outside. So if it gets a bit louder, if you can tell them, sorry. All right, so this slide will show you what I was talking about. I think there was a question on this before, right? So um, how we have to be careful in how we populate the Excel sheet, right? So let's say that we have blank values will be interpreted as no update. Okay, again, this is for the ones that are not mandatory. That has to be clear as well. So blank values, no update. The format, for example, the format in the date, right? So you have to follow this format. The text format, text and or numbers, see, 30 characters long. So this is what I meant with, you know, be careful. You can't just write uh, your life story in some of these fields. You have to be careful with the format that you use. Then the deletion value, something that's quite important here as well. So to delete a value in the equipment record, add, and here we have the slash, to a non-mandatory field. So that will tell the system that what you're trying to do is delete a value that was there prior. And it's usually the latest value added that it will delete. And 
last but not least, when we're uploading the file, right, we have to generate a text file. That's the one we're going to load by clicking on Generate Physical Verification Load File, and we'll see that button in a bit. That button is right on your Excel, the Physical Verification Excel sheet. You click on that Excel, and the, the, the Excel will actually generate a text file of the data that you have added. So remember, you cannot upload the Excel sheet itself into Moja. It has to be first a text converted into a text file and then uploaded using the transaction here that we see here below to upload results of PV into Umoja. So just uh, some characteristics I wanted to look over before we start actually doing the, uh, the work in the Excel itself. Okay, so keep these in mind. And our last slide here, which we can probably go back to later on, but let me just make sure. Yes, actually, let's cover this one first. So, and here's what we have to do also as part of the exercise, and this is what today's session is. So we're going to be populating the physical verification Excel right now. We're going to be adding the discrepancies, and we're going to be also taking a look at the characteristics, the optional fields or the blocked fields, depending on the discrepancy we select. But now, once we have done that and we have uploaded this, this text file that has been generated from the Excel, the uh, equipment list or the uh, when we use the T code IH08 and we uh, this time use the uh, physical verification layout, but for the last discrepancy, and we'll, we'll go through that so uh, just in case you're not following, we'll now extract a new equipment discrepancy list. And this new equipment discrepancy list will reflect this new physical verification updates that we have made. So whatever new discrepancies we have added and the changes will now be reflected in this report, which is the discrepancy report that we're going to pull as SD08 Equipment Verification Planner and hand out to the technical units to make the necessary changes. So this is a very important report. See, the list of all equipment with discrepancy type 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, there's four here, but in total, remember, there are five. Now, I also have to take a look. I think when I sent you guys the answers to the poll, the questions and answers yesterday, I wrote here 0, 5, but it's 0, 4. I'll correct that and send it again. We'll be provided to the technical units to resolve any discrepancies and update the equipment record. And then the SD11 will be responsible for resolving the discrepancy, okay, not SD08, and taking the appropriate action to update the equipment master based on the discrepancy report. So that's why this report is quite important, and we have to know how to extract it correctly and how to upload it, how to upload the new discrepancy results correctly as well. All right, and as our last slide, very similar to the one in session one, the only difference will be here the last T code for upload PV results. This is the T code we will be using. All right, again, you have the link to the job aid and the link to the Excel here as well in the PowerPoint. Okay, so that's it for the PowerPoint. Now we're going to go into the Excel, but while I uh, close this and go and look for the Excel, any questions, feel free to ask them now. I have here a question from Ali, uh, who's asking if they, they, there is another way to update one equipment instead of using the template, using IE02 or another T code. Okay, well, although that is something that we will cover tomorrow, because that's when we're getting into the SD11. Uh, yes, of course, if uh, let's say there's only one change to be made, you do not need to use the template. But you know what, I'm going to take advantage, Ali, now that you asked that, because it's actually a very good question. After I was testing for a while, if you try to use this template to, let's say, edit or change a single piece of equipment, at least for me it was happening, and maybe uh, Sarah can jump in, uh, the uh, the Excel crashes and it starts generating like a never-ending list of um, N slash A, right, all the way down to the bottom. That if, if I was adding just one or two pieces of equipment, I think there's a, a least a limit or a minimum of five pieces of equipment that you have to add to this Excel for it to generate the text file. If you only add one piece of equipment, 
and it also maybe depends, uh, I think because it's defaulted to have at least five lines of equipment there. I'm sure you can change that manually, but you have to be careful. So yes, if it's only one piece of equipment, you can definitely use the T-Core that you mentioned, Ali, and just go in and change that one. The template would be used for more than one. Hi, Brian. There you go. Can you hear me? Um, that might be an issue because the physical verification user will not have access to IE02. So they will have to use the template to upload the discrepancy. Um, if it's just one equipment, I'm not aware that the template was giving having issues for one record. So maybe we can take that offline. Oh, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Maybe yes, the, the thing is, I was mixing uh, two different things in one. One was the updating of the equipment records, and the other one is the actual updating of this uh, Excel. So yes, it's it's true. So they because they don't have the access, they won't be able to uh, go in manually and update exactly. the yes. discrepancies yeah. in IE zero two. They exactly so uh, thanks Sega yes Ali sure. what, I think what Ali was mentioning is for the SD11 right and updating the equipment record the only thing is then I mixed uh, this yes. um, SD08 yes. to the template okay I guess if it were the same thing but yes thanks okay. for jumping in and clarifying that Sega no thanks Brian okay. okay so now we're back to our Excel sheet here all right and we have uh, populated, again, all the information that we have copied and pasted from the previous list and the previous discrepancy types. And now we're going to be working on, let's say, at least updating the mandatory fields and also playing around a bit with the optional fields that we have here. Okay, so quickly, let's add some verification dates for this one. So again, we have to respect the uh, way that we have to enter the date, so 03.10.2018. And again, we could always just believe copy and paste the dates. If we have a ton of equipment, we don't have to add it one by one. Same thing with verified by. In this case, I'll write my own name here. And here I can just believe I can just drag this one down. If we drag it down here, of course, it'll change the date from 2018 to 192021. 20, so again, you'd have to copy and paste that one. And then the discrepancy types. So according to the exercise that we provided to you guys, which is back on screen here. And OK, at least today there's no delay between what I do and what you see. So that's great news. The discrepancy types. Add a different discrepancy type for each piece of equipment. Okay, we're only doing this for, for practice, right? To play around with the Excel a bit in the training environment. So we're going to add a, a different discrepancy type, sorry, for each one of the lines. And then complete mandatory fields, recording also the characteristics for each discrepancy added. Okay, so that means that each one of these, and we see here we have a drop down as well. We select the discrepancy. So first 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, and so on, just to see that we have different discrepancies all the way down, right? 0, 0. And that's why I gave you guys five pieces of equipment so that we could practice with each one of those discrepancies. And then now, of course, based on what we've selected here, the fields that we have next door, right, to the right, will now be either blocked or optional. Yeah, so this is what I was showing in the PowerPoint presentation before. The mandatory fields are these three columns. We've added the date, the name, and the discrepancy. And now we move to our right and add the details here that are completely optional, as Sega was mentioning. So we could just simply leave this blank again and just click on the button here generate physical verification load file and you'd see that automatically this file would populate these fields with n slash a automatically without adding anything to it and it would generate the text file if you can see at the top here surrounded by the red line we have the count of records so we see that this has been automatically populated as i was adding discrepancies. So if I change this one to 4, it changes here again. See? So 2 in there, slash. So again, 
whatever we add will then show up here and give us the total count of records of discrepancies that we're adding. Okay, let's see. I'm just making sure no questions so far. Nothing at all. Okay, so now again, changing user for all of these fields, we shouldn't add anything here. Okay, now again, if we do select the discrepancy type not found yet. So again, we're selecting the discrepancy type not found yet for something that we, and um, again here, Sega, correct me if I'm wrong, something that according to the job aid, we find, let's say, and during our physical verification, we find this piece of equipment, but it, the record of it is not in Umoja. So we would select this type of discrepancy. And the same thing would be if, let's say, it's the other way around. If we have the record of it in Umoja, but it, we don't find the piece of equipment, we would be, still be selecting the same discrepancy type. Um, Brian? Yes. Yes, so you're correct that if we, if we have the equipment record already in Umoja, but physically they, we can't find it, then we'd say not found yet, which is discrepancy one. But if they find a piece of equipment, outside of the system, but they can't find their record in Emoja, then they will have to, the record has to be created first. So if it doesn't exist, then you won't be able to assign a discrepancy against it. So the, the uh, risk of verification user will have to inform the technical section that there's a piece of equipment that they have found physically, but there is no equipment number for it outside of, uh, there's no equipment number in Emoja. So they will have to create the equipment manually into Moja, and then in the next physical verification cycle, it will be part of the the list of this, the list of equipment to be physically verified. Okay, very good. Exactly right. So there's there's really no way I could write it here in the template if I didn't have that that record exactly. before. It wouldn't show up on my report. So exactly. this would have to be something done completely offline. Yes. Go let them exactly let the technical unit that that's happening, and then maybe I guess print out a new report when that's done, and then of course uh, the record itself, the discrepancy itself, mm -hmm. it w wouldn't be necessary to actually add right now that the record is actually there. Exactly. Okay, so it would it would be something that would have to happen completely offline in that case. That's correct. That's correct. All right. Perfect. All right. Thank you, Sega. Um, Sega, I have a question here from Ikram, who's asking, how can we create a new equipment? Um, and also another question from Rayana, who says, some equipment is missing a storage location. What kind of discrepancy is a three or a four? Um, Brian, can I, I can take that. that uh, sure thing. So for the first question, how do you create an equipment record? So that's done by the SD10, the equipment maintainer, uh, the equipment master data maintainer role. And there's a specific transaction that is used to create the equipment record. And if this equipment is also a fixed asset, there is another transaction that will be used to create the asset record. And the asset will be created by the FA15 user. And then the two will have to be um, linked by the SD11 user. So for creating equipment record, it's going to involve the SD10 to create the equipment record. If it's a fixed asset, the, the FA15 will create the asset, and then the SD11 will enrich the equipment record. So it's going to involve three different users to create the record manually. Um, manual creation of equipment should be very, very rare because everything should be, most of the items are coming from a uh, purchase order, and the equipment will be at a when we do the, the goods receipt. But on that exceptional case, cases, if you do need to create the equipment record manually, it will be done by the SD10. SD10 will create the equipment, the SD15 will create the asset, and the 11 will maintain the equipment record. And what was the second question? The second question was about um, <coughs> Equipment missing a storage location. What kind of discrepancy is this? Three or four? All right. So the only time the equipment will have a storage location is if it's in stock. Um, if it's sitting in stock, then it will 
that for sure has a storage location because that's the, the based on the system design. Um, once the equipment is issued out, then it will not have the storage location. So the storage location will automatically be removed once you issue out the equipment record. Um, I, I haven't seen any equipment in stock with missing storage location. Um, if that's the case, then you can put, you can uh, select discrepancy type four, which is multiple master data. And in the comment section, you can you can elaborate a little more of what that other master data is uh, the discrepancy is on. But if you do see an equipment record that's in stock with missing storage location, uh, please send me an email or raise a ticket because that shouldn't happen. All right, Sega, thank you. Wonderful explanation. I think it's super clear. And uh, yes, if uh, those of you who have asked the question, especially the one on the creating uh, the equipment, uh, if you access the job aid, uh, steps 11, 12, 13, 14, and, and 15 on page 7 will explain what, what Sega just said. Maybe it doesn't add the, uh, the roles exactly on who's doing what, but the steps are quite clear there. And uh, first you determine if the item found is a fixed asset, and then exactly what Sega mentioned to create the asset master record manually, the equipment record, and so on. I won't re-say what uh, Sega said because she said it better. And then again, uh, when we're looking at the template itself by the storage location comment section, so exactly we select number four, discrepancy type, and just add it here where it says comment, as there is really no field to allow you to write the storage location. This change in location is more the functional location, not the storage location. Okay, perfect. Well, that's good news. And then there's more information also on the um, on the job aid, uh, of, of course. So when we're talking about list of assets that require impairment, we're not going to really cover that during this WebEx uh, session or, or series. So take a look at that in the job aid if uh, you wanted to understand the, the process and the steps to follow. But here, we're just going to cover how to um, populate the Excel that we have in our screen right now and also the optional fields and discrepancies that we're seeing. So let's play around a bit with uh, what we were populating here in the Excel. We were saying that we weren't going to touch the first two lines as they should be blocked because we selected discrepancy 0 and 1. And then we can play around with the user location status for example, we can change the name of the user, can change the location, and change the status. We shouldn't be able to change the serial number, barcode, or authorization group as it will give us an error. Okay, so in this case, and again, just for the records, we can play around just to see the difference when I pull my uh, new discrepancy report here. So let's say I'm changing the user, and I'm adding you know, Brian Barachina in this case here. Let's see in the next one, barcode authorization group. I'm changing the authorization group to T00. I think it's the same one, but again, I'm just using this as an example. And here the change in status. I'm not sure what status this one is under. And again, the change in status is not as simple as just changing a status here. Now remember, we're only recording discrepancies. We're not making any changes. The actual changes, depending on the discrepancy that we're adding, may require goods issue, may require other steps that we're not going to cover here. But in this case, what we have is the equipment assigned, installed. Okay, so maybe we can just change the status to idle in this case. And just so we see how that's going to now be reflected in the new list. So let's see. The previous discrepancy results showed that Brian verified on this day, 3rd of October, and added that there were no discrepancies. Now, don't mind the date because, of course, that's me practicing in the training environment. The discrepancies were all zero, so no discrepancy found. And now here we're changing. So the next time we pull our list of discrepancies, we should have these discrepancies, one of each, and also see the change in user column populated. Same thing with the status and the authorization group. So once that is populated, I should be able to just click on the button Generate Physical Verification Load File. And that should tell me that, see, first, 
where do I want to save this file? As you can see, it's a text file. So we have to make sure, again, the system does it automatically. And I'm going to call this one physical verification session two. So I remember, and I'm again, I'm doing it in H just because it's easier for me to get to. You guys can save it on your desktop or wherever it's easier for you to do so. Click on save, and then we should have a message in the Excel like this one that says successfully saved. Templates has been successfully saved as a text file. And uh, hold on, I think uh, we're going to go tell the guy that's hammering to stop, and we'll continue in uh, two seconds. Okay, so while well, there is no hammering, Saida has just left to tell them. So again, I say okay, and it seems like nothing else has happened. But of course, if we do access where we have saved the file, we'll see that our physical verification text file is there. The text document is there, and that's the one we're going to be using to upload into Umoja. Okay, so now the next thing I'll do is log into Umoja and do this in the system. Now, in the meantime, uh, take some time to write any questions that you would like to ask while I log in and prepare the file. Okay, so these are the steps you'll be following as well when doing the exercise. Again, you access the training environment. And remember, use the credentials in the Excel provided. And that should be, oh, wait, while this goes on, okay. That should be the ones that here. Okay, so remember, you look for your name, select the right username, and log into the training environment. So we may have some background hammering noise for the rest of the session. Okay. Hopefully it's not that loud. Could you check if there are any questions while you left? <laughs> Okay, so let me continue here. Again, very important as well, select the Umoja training system. And here where it says, the column that says name, we're selecting ECC. And I've also seen some emails with uh, SRM selected or BW selected. So we're sticking to ECC. Double click. And then here's where we populate the information. 520 for the client and the user in my case. 195 and password Umoja198. So if you do everything correctly and use the username, you should have no trouble here. Okay, so what are we doing now? We were going to upload the file, right? We're going to upload the text file and not the Excel file. And we're going to be using the T code for that, which is the one we have here. Go back to Umoja, and again, we paste the T-code, and it'll take us to the following page. Okay, it's very important that we see the execution mode, execute in foreground or in background. And just for, since we're only doing five pieces of equipment, this won't take that long, so I'm just selecting execute in foreground. And the first thing, we can execute a test run. And this is in the exercise, what the only thing we ask you to do to actually take a screenshot of the test run OK. We don't even ask you to do it without the test run. Okay, so here's what we want you to do. So the file name goes here. What we do is click on the matchbox, and now we select the text file that was generated from the physical verification template. So let me just expand this so we can see it easily. And I select here H, that's because that's where I saved my file. Now, Umoja will ask me if I permit the access. You say yes. And here's my file, Physical Verification Session 2. So we select it. 
and here it is. So I can just execute this test run and it should tell me test run successful at the bottom of the screen with a green check mark. So if I'm one of the students in this session, I would just use the snipping tool, take a quick picture of this, and that's all you would have to just copy and paste and send it back in an email to us if those of you who are actually performing the exercise. Okay, so that's one part of the exercise. If you look at the Word document and we scroll down to the deliverable in session two, it says provide the discrepancy list after uploading PV template, which is what we're going to do now, and a screenshot of test run OK. okay so the screenshot I just took and now the discrepancy list after uploading the PV template because now we know that the report is going to change. So now I just uncheck this test run. So I'm doing this change now for real in the system. I'm clicking Execute, and now it should say that everything is OK. The icons, they're all green, and it says Message Text Equipment Changed Successfully. Class, physical verification, and all my pieces of equipment. If you have some red lights here, that means you've done something wrong. Now again, don't go into the text file and make the changes and upload because then you may make another mistake and generate another one and another one and so on. Go back to the actual Excel that you were making the changes to and make the changes there. Generate a new text file and then upload that one. That's what I would suggest. So now, as these were all green and OK, that means I should be able to go back to IH08 and pull my new discrepancy list report, which should reflect the new discrepancies that I added. OK, so let's go. And yes, we can check the questions in the meantime. Yes, so I've collected three questions here. One from Richard, who's asking if an asset is in the warehouse but not in the Moja, how to deal with that? Dipandra is asking if we can use e, uh, no, sorry, IE02 and go to class overview and update physical verification information for single equipment. But I think this is linked to the somehow the previous question. Um, and Ali, uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Actually, we'll go with the first one first. Yes. Okay. Okay, and then we'll go to the next yes, one. Sir. I mean, I think the first question relates directly to what Sega was explaining before. Uh, you said if what I found is an asset, right, that is in the warehouse but not in Umoja. So that eventually, when you're doing the physical verification. You're looking for right the equipment discrepancies, but now if this item found is an asset, then you follow the steps that uh, the Sega was mentioning before, right? Eventually, there will have to be an uh, asset master record created manually, and uh, the roles SD10 will have to be involved, FA15, SD11, and so on. So it's the same thing that we were mentioning before uh, that Sega wonderfully explained before. If um, I'm incorrect, Sega, you can intervene, but I think that's uh, exactly the same case we explained before. Yes, that's and correct. Maybe... Okay, thank you, Sega. And the next question, sorry, I was taking note of the previous one. Um... Can we can we use IE02 and go to class overview and update physical verification information for single equipment? Okay, that one I'm uh, definitely I would answer that, but I'm going to leave that one to Sega. Uh, Sega, sure. what would be the uh, yes? So the physical verification user does not have access to update equipment records, so you won't be able to go into IE02 to change the to update the physical verification results. So you only have access to that P code Z. Um, what was it, Brian? I think you had it in one of your slides. Yeah, that one. So that's the, the transaction code that the physical verification user will have access to. They won't have access to IE02, so you won't be able to update the physical verification through uh, the equipment record. All right, Sega, thank you. And uh, that's, that, of course, that makes a lot of sense. If not, you'd just be doing the, the PV template to update to one or two wouldn't make any sense. But if that question has been asked, I'm afraid that maybe, could it be that some, that there is access for SD08 at times and they have been able to do this in the past? So the only 
time they would have access to IE02 is if that, on an exceptional basis, if that's a small mission and we have one person mapped to um, SD08 and SD11, um, then they would have access to do to go into the equipment record. But 90% of the time, if not more, the physical verification user is would not have access to the equipment record because of the segregation of duty. So they won't be able to go into the equipment record and update it manually. So always use the template. All right, perfect. Thank you, Sega. I think that was very clear. Next yeah, one. I think that's also related to just what you have said, Sega, um, about the role SD10. Does SD10 has access to IE02? Um, and then, yeah, that's um, that's that's it. Yeah. So yes, SD10 will have access to IE02, mm -hmm. but not SD. Um, SD8, physical verification user does not have access to IE02. Okay, good. All um, right. Just another one. Uh, uh, how to update the physical verification date uh, for a single record without using the template, but I think it's all, again, the same, right? Yes, so you can't update it without using the template. So anything related to the physical verification um, and the characteristics for the fiscal verification, the discrepancies, you'll have to use the template to, to upload the results. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Sega. Thank you, Saida. So yes, definitely. And even if you were just using one record, and here's where uh, what I wanted to, or what I was making reference to before, before I kind of mixed uh, what the SD11 and what the SD08 would be doing with this Excel on screen. If let's say you're just have, you just have one piece of equipment, one line, you see where the end of the Excel here, where we have this uh, green, uh, blue dot, sorry, I'm colorblind here. We would have to drag that up to the line that we have, because if we leave it down and there's nothing populated there, that's what's going to be generating the errors when we generate the physical verification load file. So just make sure that whatever is selected right, is, uh, belongs to the line that you have populated. So if you have two lines, then you should have two lines with this C, blue and white. See the ones below where it's uh, line 17 starts? There's nothing there. So when I generate the file later on, there are no errors. If this would have been dragged down to, I don't know, line 30, and I generate this, then of course the, the Excel would return an error. So just be very careful when you're doing that and using the template to have this uh, selected, okay, up or down, depending on the lines that you have. Okay, so we go back to Umoja now, and we were pulling the list, right? So now, of course, if we're pulling the list of discrepancies, of new discrepancies, let's say, we have IH08, we saw this T code yesterday, and again, uh, Sega did mention to us that we should use the planning plant, but again, since the exercise was created for a maintenance plant, we're going to continue using that one instead. So first of all, we're going to be selecting the category M, also the class type, because we're looking at the discrepancies, and the, this is what we have to populate to pull this. The class, again, the matchbox, I believe there is no delay, so whatever I'm doing, you guys are seeing immediately. Selecting the physical verification keyword here under class. Okay, equipment category M, we scroll down. Maintenance plant, in this case, we can just type CD10. And again, make sure that the layout at the bottom here is also the physical verification layout. So all these fields that are necessary have been populated. Now the only other thing I should populate is the equipment so I don't have the entire list of equipment and we only see what I have updated. And I'm going to do that with my own credentials that I do have in my own list of equipment. So we would select here, copy, and then do the same here and paste with this uh, clipboard. So now all my equipments are here. Click on OK and execute the report. So here is the layout. And remember, if I scroll to the right, we're not going to have the discrepancies. It only comes out if you go to Settings, Show Hide Classification. And once we do that, see, the scroll bar now has shrinked. And if we move it 
to the right, we're now going to have the changes that I just made. So you see now the discrepancy type is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and the changes that I made are now present in this list. Yeah, equipment idle and new authorization group. So whatever changes I made to the Excel and I generated the text file and I uploaded it to Emoja, now are also here represented right, with the date of the verification, who did it, and the discrepancy type. And also, more or less, the changes that are here supposed to be done. All right, so now our new list has been updated or the equipment has been updated. So now we need to generate or pull this report with the new discrepancies. And we need to pull this report because we have to hand it back to the technical unit. So quickly, what we did yesterday, same thing. We would create our spreadsheet and a table instead of pivot table. So this is the same process as yesterday, but now with the newest discrepancy list. And with this one, we have fulfilled what we wanted to cover for today's WebEx session. We do have some uh, five questions and the polling that I'll be launching in a minute or two. But before that, maybe we can take some last questions if we have any. Yes, okay. um, Deepanta is asking, do we need to classify the asset class for physical verification? Or is it automatically classified when R&I receives equipment? Mm -hmm. Another one? Okay. Well, no, we'll go one by one. Thank you, Dipendra. We'll leave that. I think Sega, if she's around, maybe Sega, you can take that question. Brian, sorry, I didn't yes. get the question. We lost connection for a minute. No problem. Saida? Yeah, I'll repeat. Um, do we need to classify the asset class for physical verification? Or is it automatically classified when R and I receives equipment? Um, yeah, so the when at the time of goods receipt, if the item purchased as an asset, all the details including the asset class will be automatically generated based on the um, material group. So it's generated by the system based on the uh, uh, material that was selected. So if the material in the shopping cart is a ZAST material, then that means it's an asset. And all the details on the asset record would automatically be would automatically be generated in Moja, so the user does not go in and classify the class the asset class once it's received. Thank you, Sega. Mm -hmm. um, there is another wall, another one on the wall uh, from Anna, who's asking how many SD10 rules can one machine have. Um, is use of uh, SD10 somehow restricted? That's um, Anna' question. Um, it really depends on the size of the mission. Um, the SD10 rule has lots of power. They have access to create the equipment record, so it should be it should only be given to a limited number of people in PMU. But depending on the size of the mission, you might want to have two, so you have a backup. Um, some missions only have one, so it really depends on, on the size of the mission. All right, perfect, Sega. Thank you once again. Hopefully that answers Anna's question, and there's no other questions. Okay, we've had uh, quite a number of questions today. Okay, so what I'm doing on screen now is simply just um, making sure that I save that new discrepancy file again under H here and I'll just finish by saving this and that's it for today what we wanted to cover has been covered and it's more than enough information to be able to finish the exercise right provide discrepancy list after uploading PV template so that discrepancy list that I just saved now on screen would be the one that you guys would have to send us in an email with a screenshot of the test run OK for the T code ZPM. So not very difficult. It actually shouldn't take you much time. It's only five pieces of equipment. So that's all we're going to require from you for this session. 
And now I'm going to launch the uh, five question polling. So you guys, please pay attention to your screens if it asks you to accept the poll so you can say yes. And it has been launched. So here are your five questions of the day. Again, covering the main uh, basics or the critical points of uh, what I consider in this uh, presentation, in this WebEx session today. Okay, so I see uh, tons of participants are taking it. Very good. Okay, and just as a reminder, while you guys are doing the uh, answering the questions now, which I see 60% uh, of the people are doing the, the questions, very good. I also see some questions in the chat. I don't know, Saida, if you're seeing them in the chat are the same ones that are in the Q&A. But for those of you who are maybe writing questions in the chat, if you could please just use the Q&A and, and post your questions through there. So Saida can check them, we can compile them and also have uh, uh, Sega respond to them if uh, we can't respond to them ourselves. So just make sure that whatever you're writing in the chat, you can also just write it in the Q&A section. Okay, another option is in the chat for those of you who are sending questions directly to the host or presenter, which is mainly to me. Make sure that when you select the send to, you're selecting the panelist, right, to all panelists, at least so that Saida can at least receive it and see the question as well and put it herself in the Q&A section. If you only send it to me, she won't be able to send it. And since she's here, I'm not really paying attention to the actual chat much. Okay, so we have another two minutes, 30 seconds for the questions. Again, these questions are quite important to see if, uh, for me to understand if you guys have uh, understood what I've explained today, as well as uh, prior knowledge. And also they're important because these are very similar to the questions that will be in the assessment later on uh, when we open the link on Friday. So it's important that you know the answers to these questions. And if you don't, when we do send the actual file later on in the day or tomorrow morning, you keep that in mind and you keep this file with you. Okay, so for those of you who have finished the um, polling questions, that's the end of our session today. And we still have some uh, three minutes, I believe, three, four minutes. If there's any other question, we can uh, answer quickly. We'll take that as well. There's, the others have 45 seconds now to finish the questions in the poll, which you can still do. Mm -hmm. But just, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, one last question from Dibanha, who's asking, can we remove the physical verification classification for UN05 equipment? Okay, thank you, Saida. 
I believe if Sega, you're still around, we can repeat the question. Yes, can you read the question again, please? Yes. Yes. Um, can we remove the physical verification classification for UN05 equipment? Um, uh, what do they mean remove? Because UN05 equipment, uh, based on yesterday's uh, session, are not subject to physical verification unless they are fixed assets. So we talked about those few uh, uh, records that were converted from Galileo to Moja under UN05 uh, category, which will be subject to physical verification. But all other uh, comments after go live, we're only looking at category M, which is SC01, um, sorry, which is UN01 equipment, which will be subject to physical verification. So I don't understand the question that removing the characteristics. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks, Sega. Maybe since you did, and you actually did mention this yesterday, well, instead of uh, just filtering by M, right, we were filtering by the O category. Exactly. Maybe, so, uh, maybe what Dependra is asking is that, right, maybe filtering by the different category, category O for these uh, assets that merged from uh, Galileo to Moja, and I yes. guess uh, making the changes through there, probably. That's where I think he's going. Yes. Um, we... Brian, we have to end the session because we are in a, in a conference room and there's another meeting uh, that's going to take right. in two minutes. Okay. Well, and nevertheless, we take, thank you, Sega. Thank you, Cass. We'll uh, take note of that question and maybe we can get some more clarification from Dependra on it. All but right. Thanks once again. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. And for the rest of us, let's... Uh, share now the uh, correct answers to the polling questions. Again, I'm compiling these. Uh, one minute to go, so the session is pretty much over today. Hopefully we covered uh, everything you needed to know, and uh, at least we did cover what I was expecting. And uh, the questions were very good. Thank you guys for participating so much. And we'll see you guys tomorrow in our last session before the assessment is launched.